So, um, yeah, this is kind of a multi-part talk. Um, the first is just the broad overview of ecology, monitoring, and management of leafhoppers in the North Coast. Uh, and then we'll get into some more specifics around our, our work with Virginia creeper leafhopper and then more recently variegated leafhopper, both of which have moved into the North Coast and started to expand their range within that area uh, over the past 10-ish um, years or so. Uh, so here we go. So here's the state of California. We've got uh, Western grape leafhopper. This is native to California, Aretha Nura elegantula. It's found throughout the Central Valley as well as the Central and North Coast areas. Uh, this thing has been feeding on grapevines since since people first started planting them and caring about whether insects fed on them or not. Um, been here for a long time. In the 1980s, we had two other species that are that are related. They're both in the genus Aretha Nura. Uh, move into California. So you first had the variegated leafhopper, Arethanura variabilis, that's found throughout Southern California and the San Joaquin Valley and the, the Southern part of the Sacramento Valley. Um, and then we, we have for a while had this sort of very isolated population around St. Uh, Helena in Napa County. Uh, we always made note of it. It, it was there, but uh, more recently it has begun to expand, and I'll I'll talk about that a little bit more later. So this is kind of broad brushstrokes about their their geography and distribution. The other species in the '80s that that showed up was the Virginia creeper leafhopper, Arethanura zigzag, and that's coming in from the north. That's found throughout the Sacramento Valley and the Sierra foothills. Um, so you can see there's this differential uh, distribution of these three species. And then there's certain places where they overlap and kind of the, the Delta Sacramento Valley, Southern part of the Sacramento Valley is kind of this nexus of all three. Um, we then subsequently around 2010 had Aretha Neuro, had Virginia creeper leafhopper um, expanded their range or were, or, or were introduced into the North coast, um, Mendocino and Lake County in particular. And that, that we'll get into that some more later. Um, here's pictures of the adults of all three species. Uh, of course, there's there are additional photographs at the UCIPM website. If you look for grape leafhopper, um, it'll it'll bring you to a page with all these leafhoppers on it. Um, but they are fairly easy to differentiate in the adult stage. They're all about the same size. They have about the same morphology. Uh, but with Virginia creeper, you have this brown and yellow zigzag uh, pattern, uh, kind of that dark dark stripe there along the back. Uh, Western grape leafhopper, it's lighter overall, kind of a cream and, and burnt orange uh, color uh, with these two prominent black spots right behind the head on the pronotum. And then variegated. Um, this photo looks pretty colorful because it's up close, but from afar, it, it's kind of a mottled rusty brown coloration. Sometimes they can have these large white spots on the side, but those, those are um, not consistently present. Uh, so you can pick these up on yellow sticky traps. You can see those adults. Um, and differentiate the species. The nymphs, uh, they also can be differentiated once they're a little bit more developed. Um, so Virginia creeper leafhopper uh, has these two dark, or these four dark, these two sets of, these two pairs of dark spots, red brown spots. Uh, Western grape leafhopper, you can see in this image, there's some yellow markings here. Those are really hard to see with the naked eye. So really it's like overall, they're sort of this pale yellow color with no distinct markings, whereas Virginia creeper has these four prominent uh, red brown spots. And then variegated leafhopper, overall, they're kind of more of an orange uh, hue in their color, and they have these really dark uh, stripes along their sides. We call those racing stripes. Um, what's important to note is that the first and second instars, you have five total instars. Those are like immature developmental stages. Um, the first and second instars are really difficult to distinguish. They haven't, like Virginia creeper hasn't developed those really prominent dark spots quite yet. There, there are ways to tell them apart, you know, using a microscope, but it's, it's not, it's not going to work very well in the field. Um, so those early instars, they're really tough to tell apart. So you got to wait for them to get a little bit further along to start differentiating them. Um, and this is just an example of that, uh, showing, showing a, um, Virginia creeper leafhopper in a very early stage. Um, you can see these really red eyes, but th those red spots haven't developed yet. Um, so they all lay their eggs in the leaf tissue, but they do this in a slightly different different manner for each species. So um, 
Virginia creeper leaf hopper, they lay their eggs just under the leaf surface. They kind of create this little raised blister looking uh, thing. And they typically put their eggs in masses with, with more than one egg together. So here's a photo of three eggs all right next to each other. And very frequently there's sort of this blue gray coating. It's, it's uh, a protective, it's called brocosomes. It's like a protective layer they put over the eggs, like a, has, has likely has an anti-feedant effect um, and may interfere with, with parasitoids. And you can see here the little red dot, that's their eye starting to develop there. So they're in these, these masses, whereas Western grape leafhopper, <clears throat> they're similarly laid just under the leaf surface, but singly and usually without any sort of coating. So Virginia creeper eggs can be found by themselves. Uh, it's rare, but they that does happen. And, and to differentiate that from a Western grape, you'd still look for that blue coating. A variegated leafhopper, they lay their eggs deeper into the leaf tissue. So these are all images from a microscope. And, and whereas you can see the blister uh, kind of egg shape here in these first two, and the, with the third, with variegated, it looks more like just like a stripe. Um, and that's just light from the back of the microscope coming through. So you can, if you're looking for these eggs, you can see them with a hand lens in the field. If you, if you hold the leaf up to the sun, you can, you can see that light come through. So it's the same shape of egg. It's just deeper in the leaf and, um, you know, potentially a defense mechanism against parasitoids and predators. And, um, but, but this is how you would differentiate across those, those three. Uh, pulling back a little bit, this is just showing those egg masses of Virginia creeper with that that blue gray sort of coating around all of them. And then in a really extreme case, you know, I, I hope you're scouting before things reach this state. This is a heavily damaged leaf with a lot of Virginia creeper egg masses on it. And what's amazing is these little green halos around those egg masses. So leaf hoppers have fed on every piece of that leaf. And as they feed, they cause that stippling. It, it, it you know, destroys the, the plant cell um, and turns a leaf white. Uh, and you can see as it's done that over the, they've done that over the entire leaf, but not directly around those egg masses. Uh, so here's just another image of a leaf showing that those, those halos. Um, these are pure suck feeders, all of them. They're, they're hemipterans. They have a little, basically a needle for a mouth part and they, they push it into that leaf uh, mesophyll feed on the plant tissue and that causes that stippling. So this is a very extreme example here on the left. You know, you typically it looks like kind of a, a scattering of little white white marks, um, you know, concentrated sometimes along the, the veins of the leaf, the ribs of the leaf. Um, but the photo on the right is a, a heavily damaged uh, vineyard up in Mendocino County. And you can see those leaves, they're so damaged, they're starting to, to crisp up and, and dry up. And so that, um, you know, while it's an indirect pest, they don't directly attack the grapes, the feeding on the leaf tissue that leads to lower vine vigor that can impact crop yield and crop quality. When you get such a heavy infestation, like, like what's pictured here, you, you start to lose the ability to, to reach adequate bricks, um, as well. So it can be really significant in terms of its impact. They're also a nuisance pest. So their phenology is such that typically you have, a, um, if you have a big outbreak, you'll have a lot of adults around harvest. And if you're manually harvesting the grapes, these things are, are gonna be flying in people's eyes and nose and ears and mouth. And it's, um, I've swallowed many of these leaf hoppers in my life. It's, it's totally unpleasant. So do not recommend that. Um, seasonal ecology in the North Coast, these are insects. So they're driven by temperature. Um, they overwinter as adults in a reproductive diapause in the leaf litter in and around the vineyard. So basically on the vineyard floor, when the grapes start to grow in the spring, push out new shoots and leaves, the adults will, will move up into the canopy and start feeding on those leaves. They'll break that diapause, they'll mate, and then they'll start to deposit eggs into the leaf tissue. Those, those eggs will hatch, you'll have nymphs, they'll go through their development, and then you'll get another generation of adults, eggs, and nymphs. Um, over the course of the season. And then towards, towards harvest in the fall, they'll go back into that overwintering mode, that diapause and, and go back onto the vineyard floor as the vines senesce and lose their leaves. So typically in the North Coast, we see two to three generations per year. Um, you know, out at the Kearney Ag Center where my lab is based, we'll see something closer to four to five just because it's, it's hotter and everything gets going a little bit earlier and goes a little bit later. So this is data, this is a figure, um, showing data that is from vacuum sampling that we did of these four primary areas in and around vineyards for leafhopper adults. And this is just reiterating that phenology I just outlined. So what you see over the winter and in the early spring 
they're primarily found on the vineyard floor, this blue, these blue bars, and then the white bars, other vegetation. So that's like perennial weeds and shrubs and stuff nearby. So they're, they're basically looking for shelter. They do some feeding, but they're looking for a sheltered place. And then you can see as, as the vines start to grow in the summer, they, they largely move into the vine canopy, although you still can always find some bit of a population outside of the vineyard. And then you'll see wild grape here later in the summer starting to, to serve as a host. And that's, that's really um, sort of a faculty, uh, facultative response. Like wild grape, the leaves are really hairy. It has a lot of natural defenses against leafhoppers. They don't really like to go onto it, but as you get populations building up over the year, there starts to be spillover. And you'll, you know, they, there's so many in a vineyard, they've got to go somewhere and some will go to the wild grapes. It's a less preferred host, but you can find them over there. And then you can see as we get into the winter, they move back onto the vineyard floor, they move back, you know, they kind of increase what's what's on that other vegetation. And that's kind of the annual cycle that, that we go through. So there's a number of different beneficial insects that can potentially affect leafhoppers. Uh, broadly speaking, we have predators and parasitoids. So we'll start with the predators. There's a, a lot of different generalist predators that we find in vineyards and that we know will attack some stage, either the eggs or the nymphs or the adults uh, of leafhoppers. So a lot of familiar faces here. You have lace wings and uh, minute pirate bugs, spiders, uh, each has been documented to do something, uh, potentially. 90% uh, of the predators that we find in vineyards are spiders. And within that group, some have a better or worse ability to impact leafhopper populations. Uh, there's been a lot of work previously to see if populations of spiders in particular could be augmented to increase um, biocontrol of leafhoppers, and, and really that produced a lot of mixed results. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. There was nothing really reliable that came out uh, of that. There's also been work, um, both historically and, and kind of being revitalized more recently, uh, looking at the use of green lace wings uh, for control of leafhoppers. And again, you know, a lot of challenges with, you know, getting those leaf, those lace wings, you know, distributed into a vineyard. And because they're generalist predators, um, you know, Sure, we've documented that they'll eat leafhoppers, but you know they also eat other stuff. And in really getting them to to kill specifically a lot of the thing we want them to kill, uh, you know, it's challenging. There's there's still some potential, you know, to to explore. I think with lace wings, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, this is showing kind of a sampling of some different generalist predators that we monitored in in vineyards for a number of years, and when we find them uh, active. And what what I'm trying to show here is that different species have different periods of activity. Uh, sometimes there's a lot of overlap with multiple generalist predators altogether. Sometimes it's, you know, like you look later in the year, very dominated by, by this thing in blue, Aureus, um, the minute pirate bug. So, you know, the scientific literature has shown that generalist predators, I'm not trying to write them off here. It's just more complicated. And, and some of the studies that are available, not, not in vineyards necessarily, but they show that you know, a complex of generalist predators, each one kind of contributes a little bit and collectively there may be some biocontrol potential there. So definitely don't disregard these, um, but it's it's hard to say, you know, with any certainty that, that one group or, or some combination, we, we don't quite understand um, how to get these to, to drive down leafhopper populations as much as we like. And just layering on one more piece here, that's the, the phenology of the leafhopper. So adults, eggs, nymphs, you know, and, and repeated here over the year, just that intersection of who's out in the vineyard, what life stage do they prefer to eat, what life stage is available for them to eat of the leafhoppers, and you know, just further kind of complexifying the thing. Now we'll go to the parasitoids, and these are much more specialized on leafhoppers, and and in this system, especially in the North Coast, we think these these anagris parasitoids do a lot of heavy lifting. So we have three species: anagris danii, anagris erythroneurae, and anagris tretiacove. Um, the females, they will deposit their egg into a leafhopper egg so that you can see that little blister thing there. That's a leafhopper egg. And she's got her ovipositor in there laying an egg. Uh, that egg will hatch, consumes the content of the, of the leafhopper egg, and then will develop into an adult. So here you can see some Virginia creeper leafhopper eggs with anagris parasitoids uh, developed inside. So you can see their little eyes and a little mouth there and their antennae sweeping down, kind of folded up. It's like, you know, like a little sleeping bag, but they're kind of facing upwards, a little grin on their face. 
And when it's time to emerge, they'll they'll chew their way vertically out of that egg. And you can you can see that here on the right, uh, which will leave a really distinct circular exit hole on that leaf. Whereas a, a healthy leafhopper egg, the, the nymph will sort of slide out parallel to the surface of the of the grape leaf. So you have these three species of leafhopper. They're all in the genus Erythanura. You have these three species of parasitoid, all in the genus Anagris. And there's different combinations of, of who attacks which of the leafhopper species. So Virginia creeper is attacked by Tretiacove and Danii, Western grape by Danii and Erythanura, and variegated by Erythanura and Tretiacove. Really, the key parasitoids in the North Coast are Anagris Danii and Anagris Erythanura. Uh, Trentia cove exists. It's very cryptic. It's very low uh, population, um, so low that when we found it in a survey at some point, uh, it was enough to like write a scientific paper about it. Like, wow, we found this thing. So it's out there. We we just don't see it a lot. But Dania and Erythroneri, those two, uh, their populations fluctuate season to season, but they they do a lot of work. And and it's important to see that you have you know shared parasitoids. So Dania is attacking both Virginia creeper and Western grape. Aretha nura is attacking both Western grape and variegated, um, and and so on here. So just to give you an idea of how um, small these parasitoids are, they're one of the five smallest known parasitoids on the planet. Uh, this is a female feeding on a little bit of uh, like honey solution under a microscope, and as we zoom out here, you can see. She basically fits within the little corner of the eye of uh, Roosevelt on a on a dime. So very very small parasitoids. Uh, this video is showing a female searching around on a leaf for leafhopper eggs. Um, I'm surprised they exist in vineyards and can persist, but they they have great populations. Um, could you imagine this is the world they live in? So right on the surface of an egg or of leaf, feeling around for the eggs. You can see these kind of blister-shaped eggs here kind of coming in and out of focus. So kind of drumming around with those antennae, looking for signs uh, of those eggs. And once she'll locate them, she'll really start to check them out and do more of this, in, in, this, this movement with her antennae, probably to determine, you know, is this the right species of egg? Uh, is it at the right stage of development that'll like work for her to parasitize? And then ultimately, you know, make a call about whether or not to parasitize it. And then once she decides to do that, it's about a two to three minute process. She'll get on top of the egg like this. You can see her kind of moving her abdomen up and down as she's putting that ovipositor, kind of penetrating into the egg, feeling around in there, and then ultimately laying a single egg um, um, inside of that egg. Um, so, the, yep, that's about it. So key to the persistence of these parasitoids is, is to understand the overwintering biology and really the differences in overwintering biology between the leafhoppers and these anagris parasitoids. So during the summer, you have grape leafhoppers active in the vineyard. Um, the anagris parasitoids are building up their populations on those leafhoppers. And, and I should mention the anagris, they can have like 10 to 12 generations per year. So they have a much more rapid developmental time. Um, which means if they get into the vineyard early, they can very quickly build up their populations and start to drive down those leafhopper, um, those leafhopper populations. So they're in there in the summer, they're reproducing on grape leafhoppers, but in the fall, those grape leafhoppers overwinter as adults in the vineyard in a reproductive diapause. And in contrast, the anagus parasitoids, they actually need to go find another species of leafhopper that overwinters as an egg and that they can then parasitize and overwinter in that egg. We, we know that most of these alternate hosts are outside of the vineyard, um, typically in natural habitat, potentially in hedgerows or riparian areas, things like that. So the anagras have to leave the vineyard is the, the main point, and they're overwintering somewhere else where the leafhoppers are in the vineyard itself. So in the spring, vines become active again, leafhoppers move up into the canopy, they're, they're right there poised, ready to start feeding. Whereas the anagris, they've got to migrate back into the vineyard from those overwintering sites. So the key thing to be aware of is, you know, the distance with which um, your vineyard sits away from those overwintering sites is likely going to determine the timing and the abundance of the anagris parasitoids that come into the vineyard. And that's something we 
demonstrated uh, in another series of studies I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. We've, we've presented at this uh, IPM seminar and other, other extension events before. Um, and as part of that, we actually uh, further characterized the overwintering habitats that were being utilized by these anagris parasitoids. So previous work had found that blackberry was a really, um, was a good overwintering host for these parasitoids. But the problem that we, we encounter now is that you know, blackberry can also host um, sharpshooters, they can carry xylella, and, you know, when we first started talking about this with growers about 15 years ago, you know, folks are pretty actively removing blackberry from their vineyards, and, you know, the earlier work on blackberry, it was looking at, you know, not only is it a host, but then could we establish blackberry in and around vineyards, um, and this plant really it's very closely tied to riparian habitats. It's it's very hard to establish it outside of that sort of habitat. So there's a lot of challenges to kind of expand that habitat um, for these parasitoids. And what was really exciting is when we did our surveys, we found a an entirely new and previously unknown host plant, coyote brush. Um, very dominant, um, you know, throughout the North Coast, um, native plant, uh, grows in all sorts of disturbed habitats. Uh, but but a really important host for Anagris erythra nure. Uh, Dania, we still only found it very limited on blackberry. Uh, Tretiakove, I'm listing its only find was on Ceanothus, and this is sort of, this is definitely a wild plant, but then there's also a lot of them in, in hedgerows and stuff, so you'll see in the next slide it, it's basically the same. Uh, alder, uh, and then a few other hosts here, willow, manzanita, um, not as not as consistent, um, you know, and, and I'll show you here in a bit why, why alder you know, can be kind of problematic as a, there, there's overwintering host and there's also host that they use uh, throughout the season is something else we found. And I'll, I'll talk about that here in a bit. We did a lot of sampling in gardens and hedgerows as well. These aren't plants that are so abundant throughout the landscape that, you know, it's, it's really driving regional populations, but these are definitely things people are putting in and around vineyards. So we wanted to survey them and uh, found an agrostanii primarily on roses. Uh, Anagris erythronuri, we found it on cat mint. That was really the most uh, sort of dominant host. Uh, there's also ceanothus, apple, pear, um, and, a, and a handful of other plants, but, but this cat mint, um, it's in the genus Nepeta, um, really a strong overwintering host. And then here's ceanothus again for Tretiakove. Again, the populations of that one are just so low. Um, this is what I was mentioning earlier, like the timing of their use. Um, you know, I sort of put that dichotomy earlier of like an agris in the vineyard, an agris out of the vineyard, overwintering, then they come back. But what we found is that actually some of these overwintering hosts, they're also used as hosts throughout the year. Uh, some of these other plants, alder and buckeye in particular, um, very seasonal hosts. So California buckeye, they leaf out in the spring. There's some leaf hoppers on there. The anagris are making use of those, but then those leaves fall off as we get into the summer dry down. Um, Alder, interestingly, you know, leaps out over the spring, summer, fall. There's leaf hoppers there that the anagris are utilizing, but it's not an overwintering host because they lose all those leaves in the fall. So um, having these two plants near your vineyard won't necessarily help those anagris make it make it over the winter. But if they're coming in from somewhere nearby, they could start using those plants as sort of a stepping stone into the vineyard. Uh, and then of course, wine grape, wild grape, we list those here. Um, but of course they they're not an overwintering host. And then there's some of these other plants that we looked at that it was just very inconsistent when we found them. We found the, the parasitoids in such low numbers. It's hard to really understand well what their role is um, in sort of this, this agroecosystem. So really coyote brush and blackberry, those are really the primary in agris overwintering habitat. We know blackberry is really problematic for a lot of reasons, uh, but coyote brush, um, very drought tolerant, um, you know, persist in these very disturbed environments. So um, you know, a really good, a really good piece of information, I think, to, to keep in mind if you're thinking about restoring habitat in and around your vineyard, or even just what might be going on at your vineyard, given, you know, the, the surrounding landscape. Um, monitoring for leafhoppers, again, there's much more detailed info that you can find on the UCIPM website, uh, but the, the primary two approaches, um, using yellow sticky traps uh, to monitor adults, uh, you can, you know, we typically put, you know, three to five of these in a block and kind of put some at the edge, put some in the middle, space them out. Um, typically out in the, the spring, March 15th, once you start to see bud break and leaves start to develop, you're going to get those, those leaf hoppers moving up into the vine canopy soon. So you put them out. We typically service these weekly. 
Um, you can leave them out for up to, you know, a month and then replace them though. Of course, if it's raining in the spring a lot, they'll start to fall down and stuff. So, um, but that's, that's useful to track when adult activity begins and then also to track kind of the, 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 the seasonal phenology of those adults. Examining the leaves to monitor for nymphs. This is really a critical practice. And the way you do this is pull about 20 leaves per block. Different folks I've talked to have different kind of regimes, but again, you want to spread that out over the area you're trying to monitor. Um, examine the underside of the grape leaf and count all leafhopper nymphs that you see there. Um, that, that's where they typically reside. Now, if you pull a leaf and start to look at it, you're, you're flipping it over and the sun is starting to hit it. Those leaf, those nymphs will sometimes they can run away really quickly to the other side. So don't forget to look at both sides of the leaf, but, but they're all going to be, you know, hanging out on the underside, choose mature, fully expanded leaves. And for the first generation, you're going to want to pull leaves from the third or fourth node on the shoot. And for the second generation and thereafter, you want to look higher up in the canopy. So the fourth to the sixth node, or just generally kind of in the middle uh, of the canopy. Uh, so just think about kind of the development of those leaves and where those, those adults are laying their eggs and then where the nymphs are going to reside. They're not mobile enough to like, uh, or they don't tend to, you know, if an egg was laid on that first node and the nymph comes out, it's not going to like crawl up to the top and start feeding on another leaf. They typically just stay where they, where they emerge. Um, start this monitoring about four weeks after, after bud break. So again, just in the spring, um, so key management practices, I'm going to, I'm going to talk a lot about biocontrol, um, in this next section, but you know, the anagris, they can be very effective, um, especially for Western grape leaf hopper. Uh, there's, there are challenges with Virginia creeper and variegated. We'll talk about that some more here in a bit. Uh, the overwintering habitat of course is key. Uh, you you need to have that closer to your vineyard. Um, there is some experimentation, both historically and, and now more recently. There's a number of growers I've, I've been speaking to who are playing around with lacewing releases. With um, you know, so far what I've seen kind of mixed benefits. I think there's there's a real opportunity there that we may want to pursue um, to do some more replicated studies and stuff. Uh, cultural controls. So. Uh, in the spring, you're wanting to remove basal leaves and lateral shoots at berry set um, for for primarily airflow and, and sunlight and you know disease management. But this can also help potentially with leaf hoppers if the timing lines up. Um, basically, think about grapes start the vines start to grow, these leaves appear, adults lay their eggs into those leaves on the lower part of the canopy, and you've got this period where um, the phenology in the early season is very distinct. Like there's a wave of adults, then there's a wave of leaves, and then there's a wave of nymphs. So you kind of have this opportunity at that point, potentially, uh, if you pull those leaves off after the adults have laid the eggs, but before those eggs have um, not necessarily hatched, but before the nymphs have moved all the way into the adult stage, <clears throat> you know, they're kind of stuck on those leaves. And so if you're pulling leaves at that time of year, that that can potentially contribute to leafhopper control. Um, and then finally, chemical controls. So these are, again, they're pure suck feeders, uh, systemics like Admire and Belay, not endorsing specific products, but systemics, those are some examples. Um, they, they are generally very effective. Um, uh, insect growth regulators and, and oils can also be used. Um, and then if you're an organic grower, and, and this is where, you know, we'll kind of focus a little bit more with Virginia creeper leaf hopper in particular, um, Options include pyganic, um, neem oil, zataractin, oils and soaps, as well as kale and clay. Um, these are these are tough products. They're they can they can be expensive. They, they have way less resi re residual effects. There's negative impacts on beneficial insects. It's it's a real challenge. Um, but that's that's kind of the those are the key management practices for leaf hoppers. Um, I'm going to transition now to talk about more about Virginia creeper leafhopper and a area-wide IPM program that we developed for this insect when it first arrived in the North Coast and then kind of dovetailed out with our more recent efforts um, uh, focusing on both Virginia creeper and variegated. So this was a project um, collaboration uh, with Lucia Varela, the IPM advisor in the North Coast, Glenn McGordy, viticulture advisor in North Coast. Uh, Sergey Trapitsin, uh, basically the global expert on anagris parasitoids. He's based out of the UC Riverside Entomology Museum and then Kent Dana, 
uh, extension specialists on the Berkeley campus. So as I said, we had expansion of Virginia Creeper into Mendocino and Lake County and ar around approximately 2010. Uh, there was more recent expansion of this insect into Napa around 2019, 2020, and I'll, I'll talk about that here in a bit, um, but we'll just kind of start at the beginning. So there's these initial outbreaks of Virginia creeper in Mendocino and Lake County that start getting reported around 2011, 2012. Um, Glenn McGordy and Lucia Varela, those are sort of the first responders to this. And, and you know, at the time I had been working with Kent on, on this leafhopper overwintering and kind of landscape ecology work. So we got kind of kind of bridged that work into this um, this area-wide program for Virginia Creek Relief Hoppers. So myself as a postdoc at the time, Kent Dana, and then Sergey, and then a number of regional growers and PCAs, um, very collaborative group. And what we did initially was delineate those Virginia Creeper outbreaks, try to understand their varietal preferences, their use of alternate host, seasonal development patterns, as well as parasitism rates, and then of course some some spray trials. Uh, so initially, this is what we saw. They were sort of around Clear Lake. Uh, they were throughout you, the, the kind of Ukiah to Hopland corridor, but not in the Anderson Valley, not in the Redwood Valley, not in the Potter Valley, and not in Napa or Sonoma, as far as we knew. Again, this is 2013, 2014. One of the first things we noticed is that Western Grape Leafhopper, they will sort of equally go for any variety. Um, these were three varieties we selected from a trial at the Hopland uh, research and extension center that had different levels of leaf hairiness or, or uh, tormentum. Um, and so that is in contrast to Virginia creeper leafhopper that uh, really seemed to prefer varieties that had less, uh, like more glabrous leaves. So leaves that were smoother, you no know, leaf hair. And if you think about it, it's probably because they're laying these clutches of eggs and they need a little bit more space to do that effectively. Whereas you know, so a really hairy leaf, it's going to interfere with their ability to do that. Whereas for Western grape leaf hoppers kind of singly putting those eggs in and leaf hairs, you know, they can kind of work in between them and not a big deal. So that's an important thing to keep in mind, though, if you're going to prioritize where to scout for this insect, look at these, um, you know, something like Grenache sooner um, than like Zinfandel or, or something with more hairs. The phenology, this is the same figure you saw before. So it basically tracked the exact same as Western grapes. So they're down in the leaf litter in the winter. They come into the canopy in the spring, summer, and fall and kind of go back and forth. Um, there's seasonal development that, that again, followed very much what, what we saw and were familiar with with Western grape leaf opera. You get this flush of adults in the spring that leads to a bunch of eggs. And then you have nymphs after that. And then later in the year, and this is true of all the leafhoppers, but, but especially Virginia creeper, things get really messy. So um, I was mentioning these distinct curves or these distinct life stages. So there's the adults, there's the eggs, here's the nymphs. You get later in the season and you have all life stages kind of wrapped up together. And that's, that's really important for organic growers to understand because, you know, at the time when we first started responding to this, people were putting on a spray later in the season it would knock back the adults, but then just more nymphs would keep coming, you know, and, and that's in contrast to, you know, early, more aggressive applications in the spring where, you know, you can really knock down, there's not like more eggs waiting to hatch if you time your sprays correctly, you can really isolate those, those life stages. A really important thing to understand about Virginia creeper leafhopper is that they become active earlier, about two weeks or 10 days, two weeks earlier in the season than Western grape leafhopper. And this isn't necessarily the adults. Both species, the adults kind of become active at about the same time and start moving up into the vine canopy at the same time. But it seems like Western grape leafhopper needs to feed for this 10 to 14 day period before they can sort of break that diapause and start depositing eggs into the leaf tissue. Whereas Virginia creeper, it seems like they pop up and they immediately can start laying eggs. And so what we see, this is these are nymph counts that I'm showing here. You know, you see earlier appearance of those nymphs. And so what that means is, you know, and what we saw happening in this initial stage, like folks had a certain timing for when to go out and look for leafhoppers based on, on Western grape leafhopper. If you 
follow that, you know, and you have Virginia creeper in the vineyard, when you show up on day one, it's like, whoa, what are all these leaf hoppers here? It's you're already kind of two weeks behind, you know, so you really have to keep that in mind. And that's why putting those sticky traps out is important to capture the adults early in the season and say, okay, they're, they're moving up into the canopy. Like it's time to start looking at leaves for nymphs. Um, we evaluated parasitism and immediately we're, we're struck by, by just the total absence of parasitism of Virginia creeper. Um, in contrast to Western grape leaf hopper, you, you have fairly consistent parasitism uh, of this of this uh, of this pest. So immediately we started thinking, well, is it you know is there not enough overwintering habitat? And and that's that's not really the case. I mean, in Mendocino and Lake County, there is a ton of habitat um, and coyote brush and blackberry and those key plants like in and around these vineyards. Um, so we already kind of ruled that out as a, as a potential factor and. So started to look at the actual species of parasitoid that we were finding uh, attacking these eggs. And this is with Sergey doing all these ID identifications of these tiny little parasitoids. Um, so what we found, uh, Aretha nuri and Danii, both on Western Greek leafhopper. That's, that's a well-known association. But what is so shocking about that is that Anagris Danii is also the key parasitoid known to attack Virginia creeper leafhopper. And these are eggs that are on the same leaf. So you, so Danii is on that leaf, tapping around with those antennae, looking for leafhopper eggs. It, it biologically, it's capable of attacking Virginia creeper leafhopper eggs, but for whatever reason, was not going for them whatsoever. So this was something that was very striking to find initially. Um, what what this means uh, is that you know your typical program, at least in an organic system for Western grape leafhopper, or in a system where you're not using neonicotinoids, um, you typically wanna give biocontrol a chance with this pest because there's a fairly good chance that those parasitoids will get in there early in the season. If you see something like 10 to 20% biocontrol on that first, you know, parasitism, 10 to 20% parasitism of that first flush of eggs, you probably have a pretty good chance that those, those anagras are gonna build up populations and start to start to control, um, control leafhoppers. But, you know, if if that doesn't happen, you know, a spray could go on in, later in the summer, closer to harvest. But in the absence of that, with, with Virginia creeper, there's zero parasitism. These sprays needed to be moved forward. And and this is again what we kind of found when we first started talking to growers about this that they were treating it like Western grape leafhopper. Suddenly realizing they had a ton of Virginia creeper, they needed to put something on. It was July or August, and you just had all those life stages out there, and a lot of these contact products just weren't very effective at driving them down. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, it's hard to differentiate between these two species early on. They basically look the same with the naked eye. Um, and this is a leaf with Western grape and Virginia creeper together. Um, so a lot of folks, you know, we're, they really needed to, you know, we need to get some more resources out there to clear up, you know, how to identify these things. And, um, and again, people may have just missed it initially. So it's so a number of spray trials, primarily uh, conducted by Lucia Varela, um, some additional work by myself and Kent. Um, and this is just a sampling of different products and the life stages that we found them to be uh, effective against in the, the years we ran those trials. So pyrethrin, uh, the Zataractin oils, uh, all, all can be effective. What we put together for this area-wide program was was sort of this combination of, of short and long-term objectives. Um, with different parties, you know, across Riverside, Berkeley, and, and UC Cooperative Extension handling different areas. So, you know, first and foremost, it's like we have to triage these outbreaks, do a lot of outreach and education, get folks up to speed on how to identify and, and start managing this new pest, uh, you know, through education, and then uh, testing out chemical controls, doing some regional monitoring. Uh, but, but again, this grower newsletter and blog, project website, all these all these resources we're trying to get get together for folks. Um, that's all short-term stuff. And then in the long-term, like figure out this biocontrol piece and, you know, can, can we get the Anagras Danii in the North Coast to start going for Virginia creeper or can we find another strain and bring it in? So that's sort of the short and long-term uh, combo approach used here. So grower outreach, you, you all may remember, there was a number of different field days and seminars and we started this, this blog and website, um, just trying to get all the info out there to everybody. Uh, focusing on pest ID, spray timing, all, all these things I talked about. So we had a couple, two to three meetings per year, and then a lot of informal meetings, of course, just farm calls, text, et cetera. Um, we developed this project website. This is still active. Uh, this is basically the home 
for all of this Virginia creeper leafhopper work that we've been conducting over the years. Uh, and we'll, we'll, as we resume this, this project now, um, with a recent uh, grant we were awarded, uh, there, there will be updates coming. So definitely bookmark that website and, and that in combination. UCIPM has kind of your net net takeaways and, and this Virginia Creeper has, you know, if you really want to get into all the details, here's all these things we did. Here's all, you know, all the little pieces of information that we that we have about it. Um, so that that grow education outreach part, you know, we activated that and then there's there's this biocontrol part. So this is um of various surveys and experiments we conducted over over those those initial years. So one of the first things we did was take this anagris danii from the north coast and put it into a no choice um, situation. Basically, force it. See if we could force it onto Virginia creeper leafhopper. Um, what was astonishing is that even in that sort of situation, basically they would rather die than attack Virginia creeper leafhopper. Um, so this is the results from that trial. We saw, you know, fairly consistent parasitism of Western grape leaf hopper. And, you know, I think this tiny little sliver of bar, there was just one out of, you know, dozens of parasitoids we trialed, um, that actually went for it. So basically it doesn't seem like you can force it on to Virginia creeper. Um, what we did at the same time was survey vineyards across Northern California, um, you know, Sierra foothills, Sacramento Valley, North coast and see if, if this, this lack of parasitism was consistent across the, the range that we knew um, for Virginia creeper leafhopper. What we found um, was that in the Sacramento Valley in particular, here's Yolo County, um, there did seem to be fairly consistent parasitism of Virginia creeper leafhopper by Anagrostania, like the same species we have in the North Coast, but What's up with these ones out in the Sacramento Valley? They're attacking Virginia creeper leafhopper, but but the ones in the North Coast are not. We we did some additional studies. I'm not showing them here, but we basically brought grapevines inoculated with Virginia creeper eggs out to the Sacramento Valley and saw that those parasitoids would indeed attack it. Um, so that catalyzed us to start this rear release program where we uh, grew large colonies of the Anagrostanii strain from the Sacramento Valley and then brought it into vineyards in Mendocino County, Mendocino and Lake County. And, and some of our initial work in 2015 showed, you know, as we released these things, um, we saw pretty significant parasitism um, start to kind of take off. What's, what's surprising is in our no release control, which was like a few miles down the road, um, we did see this late season parasitism. And we've seen this kind of throughout the life of this project. It's, it's too little too late. And like, and in this experiment, it, Maybe our parasitoids started building populations and moved down the road or something. But um, you know, this is kind of an interesting artifact that we'll we'll start to kind of drill in on a little bit more. 2016, 2017, we had this massive rearing operation at the greenhouses at UC Berkeley. Just like thousands of these parasitoids we were producing, putting them out in all these different vineyards. Uh, you can see here these vials with you know hundreds of anagrostanii from the Sacramento Valley uh, strain being released out in the vineyard. We concentrated those releases around Hopland um, and then kind of the, the center of, of Clear Lake. This is sort of ground zero for these Virginia creeper outbreaks. Uh, and this is just showing you aggregate numbers of how many were released over how many sites and where. Um, and what we saw was really variable. So th what these graphs are showing, the green bars, that's when a release of parasitoids occurred and, and how many parasitoids were released. And then the the yellow and blue bars that's showing you parasitism levels at you know the vineyard where we release them versus a control block uh, that was at least a couple miles away. So here, this this is kind of what we expected to see. You start releasing these parasitoids, and eventually you're going to start seeing increased parasitism at that block. Again, though, here's this control where it shoots up at the end of the year. Not sure what what is going on there. If that's spillover or or what. Um, but here's another release site where we did also a bunch of releases, uh, but really variable levels of, of parasitism. Um, here's another place we put tons of parasitoids at, but still not a lot of parasitism. Now, there's a lot of questions about the timing uh, of these releases, which basically were determined by our rearing capacity. Um, but, you know, still as a first pass, this, this was something we wanted to do and see, see how that would work. 
when we looked at it, and it wasn't just those three sites, there were dozens of sites that we released across, um, or a dozen sites, um, but just kind of a sampling of how trends tended to go. And so when we looked at the who was attacking Virginia creeper leafhopper and Western grape leafhopper, um, you know, with Western grape, we see the, the usual kind of Danii and Erythronary splitting themselves. You can't, it's, it's kind of gone like this in our other studies where I've looked at this, like there's kind of big Dania years and big Erythronura years and sort of go back and forth. Virginia creeper leafhopper, we did find both species attacking, which is especially here, Erythronura, that's, that's really surprising, but you do have a little sliver of it up here. So, uh, you know, but it's primarily an agris <clears throat> and this doesn't necessarily contradict what I was outlining earlier, like these two parasitoids attack this leafhopper, these two parasitoids attack that leafhopper. Because they're all so closely related, uh, when you have high population situations, um, we do occasionally see one of the species that's not, you know, kind of the dominant one that attacks uh, a given leafhopper, like kind of put its toe in the water a little bit, maybe parasitize some of those eggs. So it's not totally surprising, but but again, just Danii, that's the key one for Virginia creeper. Um, and this is just kind of summarizing some of the short-term outcomes, like people are able to differentiate the two species. They've got the proper timing and, and of monitoring and sprays down. The spread after 2013 um, was was fairly limited. Uh, I think once people kind of tightened up their programs and and definitely the severity and persistence of the outbreaks was um, certainly lower than, than what we saw when we came in in 2011, 2012. Uh, Long-term goal of establishing biocontrol. Um, you know, we established, we identified this novel strain of DNAI we ran this rear release program. Uh, there's a lot of improvements in that effort at, over time as, as we went along. Um, developed some new information on the parasitoid systematics. Um, and, and we did see parasitism increase relative to 2012, 2013, but still these, these leafhoppers are still a problem. And this, this project, um, you know, there's, there's more to come here. So um, it was a good start. And, you know, I would say we're not, not quite done yet. And, um, there's a lot more to know about Anagris and kind of their timing and preference on Virginia Creek leafhopper and also how to how to rear and release more of them. I mean, we released 30,000 total over a two year period. That's that sounds like a lot, but it's it's not given the acreage of, of vineyards and, and the extent of leafhopper outbreaks. Um, so these are some questions that were raised in the time about you know what we should do next. And now I'm going to sort of transition to the most recent chapter here. This is our, our focus on the continued expansion of leafhoppers on the North Coast, um, work that was conducted from 2018 until, until the present. It's a collaborative effort. Um, Monica Cooper, Cindy Cron, Chris Chin, and of course, Sergey and Kent still. So, um, you know, uh, it's kind of like we're getting the band back together. And Lucia and Glenn have retired. Cindy and Chris are in. And, and kind of rebuilding this team to, to continue pushing forward, because as I said, this still, still is a major problem, uh, especially so now that we're seeing some expansion. So after our, our project ended, uh, that, that area-wide program, which was, I should mention, funded by the Department of Pesticide Regulation, um, we continued to do some regional monitoring at a lower level, um, 2018, 2019. Uh, and this is just showing some of those sites. You, you've got kind of the usual places that, that we would want to look for this. This is showing the parasitism rates, um, 2016, 2017, uh, you've got two different color bars. The, the blue is kind of the early season sample. The, the green is the later season. Uh, we, we tend to see higher parasitism later in the season, um, which can be too little too late, but something is happening just trying to understand what's going on with these anagris parasitoids. And 16 and 17, those are the two years we were doing all these releases. And then the first survey we did, or the surveys we did in 2018, you can see a significant drop off um, and that's likely because we weren't doing all of that mass introduction uh, type of work. There's, there's always been questions about will that strain from the Sacramento Valley establish and, you know, what happens when they interbreed with the Danii that are, you know, already there in the North Coast. Uh, there, there's a lot of questions about whether or not this thing would establish. So we saw some parasitism still, but, but significantly lower. A survey in 2019, again, just following that same approach, we're seeing even less parasitism uh, overall. So the whole thing's kind of kind of waning away. Um, so definitely a lot of questions on the table. Like I, I don't think this parasitoid established itself necessarily out there. There's a lot of work that we need to still do on their population genetics. It's it's unclear at this point whether the Anagris Dania and the Sacramento Valley 
and the North Coast are different strains or if they're actually different species. Um, you know, this group, they're just, they're so tiny. They're so hard to differentiate. Um, you know, you, if you read old literature, you'll see Anagris epos is what's uh, referred to as the key parasitoid. That was actually uh, through work that Sergey did in the, in the 90s shown to be a complex of Anagris danii, Tretikovae, and Erythroneurae. Questions remained about Dania, whether or not that was a complex of species itself. So um, definitely more work that we'd like to pursue here to, to better understand what's going on. So we get into 2020 and we, we start to get reports of expanding Virginia creeper and variegated leafhopper populations um, from Monica Cooper out in, out in Napa County. So I mentioned earlier, there's this little pocket of variegated leafhopper in Napa, um, but and that's something we've been aware of, but it seemed in 2020 to start to kind of move out of the, the range that it traditionally was in. So this is kind of a complicated map here, but this is just showing where, where we find Virginia creeper leafhopper. If you remember Potter Valley, that was initially uninfested, but in 2019, we started to find it up there. We see Virginia creeper all the way down to Southern Lake County. There's been intermittent populations of Virginia creeper in uh, Pope Valley. And then in 2020, when we started to see this expansion of variegated leafhopper, there was also um, the Virginia creeper leafhopper started to show up. So, you know, did it kind of make its way down here through Pope Valley and, and kind of pop out right here in, in Napa? Unclear, but uh, still just this was the status in 2020. And then there's all these areas in Sonoma County and, and Carneros and stuff that we just had not surveyed that intensively. They were kind of unknown. So, um, with with Monica's with a lot of help from Monica's, you know, took in a lot of leaves in our lab, processed them to see which leaf hoppers were present uh, across these sites in Napa. And you can see different levels of variegated. Uh, definitely, you know, Virginia creeper where it's there uh, tends to be fairly dominant, you know. And then, and of course, Western grape leaf hopper at all these sites. So, so definitely seeing expansion. Um, when we look at parasitism rates, uh, Western grape leaf hopper fairly consistent, you know. 15, 20, 30, 40 percent. Like that's that's kind of what we expect to see. And that's that's adequate for control. Some parasitism of variegated leaf hopper closer to like 10 percent. Uh, in many cases, no parasitism. And then Virginia creeper, as expected, just across the board, zero parasitism. So um, you know, that sort of set us in motion to, to start developing a, another coordinated response. Like, like I said, variegated leaf hopper kind of low-key presence around St. Helena, but starting to expand into Rutherford. Uh, we, we realized we needed to expand surveys after 2020 to, to further delineate these outbreaks and keep better track of what, you know, what's happening with the Virginia, Virginia creeper, what's happening with parasitism. Um, and so that that led to the development of a proposal that went to the American Vineyard Foundation this, this past January and was, was successfully funded um, to conduct pest surveys, regional monitoring, renew the education and outreach work, and then start, start thinking about biocontrol uh, with these surveys as a as a basis. So here's our survey work from 2023. We've got uh, the new team together, Monica, Cindy, Chris, and then um, a lot of great collaboration with Bonterra as well. Todd Madden in particular is out sampling vineyards, sending us samples as well. Um, so you've got the county maps here. You can see stars kind of approximately where the samples were taken. In some cases, there were multiple sites kind of in and around where uh, a single star might be. But, you know, trying to just see comprehensively what is going on in the North Coast um, with, with these leaf hoppers. So we, we did that by taking an early and a late season sample, which is kind of historically how we've approached this. Uh, and here's a, here's a summary of what we found. Um, this is just who is present where. So Lake and Mendocino County, you have Virginia creeper and Western grape, um, you know, slightly different proportions, but it's kind of artifact of the sample sites kind of mixed up there generally. Um, Napa, you have the variegated leaf hopper layered into that. And as I look at this, I realize the colors are kind of off. This red part here, that's that's variegated leaf hopper. Um, and then you look at Sonoma and it's dominated by Western grape leaf hopper, although you see these little slivers here. Um, and that was that was interesting. Maybe, you know, what I put up here on the bullet point for, for variegated leaf hopper, maybe there's some in Lake and Sonoma. Um, and I'll I'll kind of speak more to that in a minute here. So Western grape leafhopper, these are the parasitism rates we're looking at. And, you know, basically June and September, these are early and late season samples. And across all the counties, like, this is what we expect to see. So everything's totally normal with these, like, really nothing to, to highlight here, except they're just doing what we expect them to do. 
Um, variegated leafhopper, uh, we did see some parasitism of this um, in Napa, uh, as well as in Lake County. And the find in Lake County was kind of strange that, that we never found them again after that first sample. Um, and they were fairly low population. So was it, um, you know, is whether or not it's established there and, and how widespread it is, um, we, we really infrequently found it, but it, but it was in some samples. I put these big X's over certain counties because that's, that's not that there's no parasitism there. That's just, we didn't find populations in that county. Um, Virginia creeper leafhopper, some parasitism, still relatively low. Really a lot of questions about whether the local and Agrostanii are adapting to them or if those releases led to something that, that is more long-term, but um, again, more parasitism is needed. And this is just the final slide summarizing where we see these different species. Um, if, it's, if it's a strong color, it's like clearly it's very established there. If it's a lighter color, we're kind of seeing mixed, um, you know, low abundance. If there's pluses, that's good parasitism, one plus, that's just basic, very little parasitism could be augmented, not even clear what's going on with variegated in Lake County. Um, but I'll just end, you know, keep your eyes out for these things, talk to the farm advisors if you see them. We have a, there's uh, on the Napa Vineyard Views and News, there's a nice ID guide that's available. You can email me for that. There's also the project website and just want to conclude by acknowledging all of the institutions and people that helped support all of this work over basically a decade. This is definitely a hugely collaborative project and I think I'm out of time, but I'd be more than happy to stick around and answer some questions or um, now or offline. Thanks so much. Thank you, Houston. Matt will um, ask you some of the questions that have come through. Okay, so we got the first one here. What might be the best way to minimize the overwintering leafhopper adults? Where exactly are they overwintering and can we disrupt this? Yeah, that question has always come up and it's it's a real challenge. I uh, They're overwintering in leaf litter, you know, down on the floor in and around the vineyard. And, you know, there's been kind of ideas about, well, could we go in and like vacuum them all up or, you know, till under all the soil cover in the spring and, and kind of kill them. And just none of that stuff has really ever proven that effective. And, and, you know, the fact that they can move out to other areas right outside the vineyard, you know, weedy patches and stuff, um, you know, it, it it's a real challenge. And, you know, we've thought about animal integration and, and things like that. And, um, I, it's really not clear. There's not a clear solution or an approach there. I mean, there's been years that I've seen vineyards underwater even and thought, Hey, that's, you know, great. They're going to wash them all away. And, um, you know, it's like one of the worst leaf opera years ever after that. I, I just, <laughs> so it's, it's really a challenge. I, I don't have a good solution for that. I, um, you know, also just think about the benefits of having soil cover over the winter and in the spring versus, you know, trying to, Get all that stuff gone so you can maybe make it more difficult for leaf hoppers to persist. I, I just don't have a clear, strong recommendation for any of that. Okay, so the next one is Have you seen a relationship between fire damage, parasitism, and leaf hopper populations? Fire damage? Like two yeah. vineyards? Huh. Um, no, we've never really studied that. Um, I can imagine if there's a lot of fire and that burns up all your overwintering habitat, there's, you know, probably going to be an issue. Um, yeah, we never, that's, you know, we saw vineyards on the central coast during some of those really, really bad fires where that were kind of moved through the vineyard on the ground cover and, you know, did that affect leaf hoppers? I, we just don't know. That's, that's a hard, yeah, that's just a big question. Okay, it looks like the last one here is, um, Will lime sulfur in dormant season reduce leafhopper populations in the cover crop of vineyards? Like if you apply the lime sulfur to the cover crop? Is that how you're reading that question? Uh, yeah, I know it's not. not. <laughs> yeah. um, whoever asked that, speak up. Uh, unclear, I don't know. Um, I've never even looked at that before. Um, applying something to the cover crop, you're probably going to have a lot of challenges with penetration right like if that were to be something that even worked right like they're on vegetation it's for shelter is what they're seeking like on a hot day they'll they'll need to feed on something nearby but you know, if you have a big stand of cover crop you're spraying something on it the leafhoppers are all down at the bottom 
in the winter. And so I think that's probably not a good approach. So Houston, it, he wrote, it is applied to both grapes and cover. Yeah. So doing that in the winter, it, there's no leaf hoppers there. Applying it to the cover, um, like I said, I think they're going to be too far down there for it to have an effect. I'm not even sure if that product is has kill activity against leaf hoppers. 